morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing great. Welcome to your first session of financial management. Now, before I introduce the subject very quickly, let me introduce myself. I'm going to be your mentor for your FM paper. I am Shilpi Jain, ACCA. I qualified my ACCA back in 2009. I had gone to the UK to do my ACCA because at that time when I had started, ACCA was, you know, the operations, uh, even though they had started, but uh, classes from India were obviously not possible. So I had gone down to the UK to pursue my ACCA. And after having, you know, gained experience a few years in the UK, that's when I migrated back to India. And I have been in the business of teaching ever since then. So this paper, Financial Management, has been one of my domain papers along with FM. I also take up strategic business leader at the professional level. So let me now very briefly introduce you to the way the classes are going to be conducted. See, even though the class is a live online batch, I want this class to be extremely interactive. I want you all to respond to when I ask a query. I want you all to solve questions when I give you a question. Just because you're not like physically in front of me does not mean that you can, you know, take the class while roaming around and going here and there. Why? Because that is something which, you know, I'm giving like my more than 100% to the class. But if you're not on the receptive side, you're not sitting with an open frame to, you know, I'm just here to take my class and study and understand to be able to pass the paper. Believe you me, nobody in the world can help you pass the paper. Financial management is a difficult paper. It is not just only a number crunching paper because that is what like most of the students perceive of it. Yes, there will definitely be some calculations that you will be required to make. But a lot of focus is also given on the theoretical aspects of the concepts. So you have to be very sure you have to be with me live. You have to be with me like, you know, physically and mentally 100% with me so that you are able to understand and grab what I'm trying to teach you. Again, like I said, the classes are going to be online, but I want the classes to be extremely, extremely uh, interactive. So you are all going to make use of the chat box facility in your Zoom platforms to raise queries so that I can repeat your queries so that everybody can understand what the query is and only then I will answer the query. But very important is to raise queries. Why we are here? You are here to learn, right? And anything that I'm saying, you have a doubt, please feel free to ask queries. That is precisely what, you know, will make the session a fruitful session for you. Just me saying and you understanding half of the thing and, you know, just, just thinking about and keeping sure about half of the concept is definitely not going to help you. Secondly, Nobody is going to carry a pen and paper to the class. Absolutely no pen and paper used in the class. All questions I will be doing on Excel. And similarly, you will also be doing on Excel. Why? Because the exam is a computer-based exam. So we have to familiarize ourselves with the functionality of the computer from day one itself. So please do not bring a pen and paper to the class. The only thing you are required to bring along is your laptop, your PCs, and that's about it. Do not take classes on the phone. Why? Because obviously you will not be able to you know, navigate screens and solve your questions on the phone. No, you know, bring along some, some discipline in your class. Bring along a PC or a laptop with a mouse so that you know you can actually solve questions. You can listen to me. You can, I will be showing you some interactive videos about sessions as well. So just, you know, just think that, okay, do not disturb me for the next five hours because I am taking a class. Don't worry, the class is not going to be like, you know, be a one stretch five hour class. I am obviously going to give you ample amount of breaks and breathers in between so that the class is something that you can cope up for the five hours. Why I've kept the timing to be a little extended is that I don't want to compromise on quality. I hope you're all aiming towards the next session, which is December. How many of you are going to be sitting for the December session? Send me in the chat box. I hope you're all here for the December 22 FM paper. Wonderful. So we've literally got like two and a half months maybe, right? So what we have to do is 
in the next two and a half months, be with me. Follow what I'm saying. If I'm telling you to do these questions as homework before the next class, please do them. Do not come to the class before having done your homework and thinking that, okay, you know, I'll do all the questions at the end of this, you know, when the classes are going to get over. No, it will be just too late for you then. Why? Because the classes are going to, you know, get over literally like almost like two weeks before the exam. And at that time will be your revision time. It will not be time for you to start practicing your questions. No, it will be too late then. So please, just listen to my advice, follow what I'm asking you to do. And if you do that, I can actually guarantee that you will pass your paper. But if you don't follow what I'm saying, if you're not honest to what I'm asking you to do, then nobody on earth can, you know, actually help you pass the paper because it is a difficult paper. I'm not trying to intimidate you here in the first session, but yes, I'm trying to state some facts some ground rules of the class which should be clear to everyone in the class. So apart from Udit, everybody is going to appear for the December exam, which is wonderful. Why? Because that means that you and I are both on the same page. I know that this is what our you know motive is for the next two and a half months. And when you are with me, when you are you know following what I'm asking you to do, when I, you're doing simultaneous question practice, you're just only preparing yourself best for the upcoming exam. Okay, so uh, very quickly, I want everybody to tell me in the chat box, if this is your first paper of ACCA, or have you given some other subject paper of ACCA previously? Because some of you might be coming via the exemptions route, so this could be your first paper. Some of you might have given a, you know, an ACC exam previously. So I need to know that what is the experience of the class. Udit uh, is fourth paper. Ashish first, Tanvi first, Rohit first, Piyush first, Naman second paper, Malathi first, Rishika first, fourth, okay, sorry. Aryan second paper of the skill level and has given two knowledge level papers. Wonderful, Aryan, Charika first, Priyanka second, Zishan second. Okay, wonderful. So I see it's a mixed bag of class. Few of you do have an experience of having given a, you know, an ACC exam previously. For a lot of you, this is going to be like your first ACC exam. So believe you me, not only you have to prepare yourself for the subject, you also have to prepare yourself with the right technique to be able to handle an ACC exam. I hope everybody is clear with the fact that it is going to be a computer-based exam. You do the exam at home, you do the exam at center. The exam is going to happen on a computer. It is not going to be a pen and paper exam. One more thing I want everybody in the class to understand is that I want each one of you to please book your center-based exam. So when the window opens up for December exam, please do not wait for the last day to book your exam because centers will be full by then. You have to book your center-based exam. I don't want any of you to be giving a remote exam because believe you me, even though the system is, is, is fabulous, the, you know, the remote invigilation is fabulous, but I know for a fact that there are many, many students who face many, many technical issues a screen gets frozen, not able to you know, contact proctor, electricity went off. Why do we want to you know, add so much of you know, stress to our life to, or to an already difficult paper? So please book your exam at the center so that the only thing you can concentrate on the day of the exam is your exam and not the other technicalities, not the other you know, tips and bits. So please, it's my... It's my you know, very, very strong advice to everyone here appearing for the exam that book your exam at the center, not the remote, not the remote exam. Even if that means that you have to travel down to, to another city to give your exam, please do that effort, right? Because I don't want you to waste your three months. I don't want you to go through that trauma of the, uh, the remote exam and this and that happening. And then that ultimately impacting your performance and resulting into a failure. No, we will just keep all of that anxiety away. What we will do is that we will straight away book the center-based exam, go to the center and give your exam. 
right? Is that okay with everyone? So very important is all of you need to be interactive in the class so that I know that you're listening to what I'm saying. It shouldn't be like I'm talking to my screen for five hours, right? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you guys for your confirmation. Okay, so now I think uh, I've given you like a good heads up into what we are getting into. Why I wanted to stress upon all of these facts at the very beginning of the class itself is that everybody knows what we are heading into, how we have to head into it, what is going to be our plan for the next two and a half months, how we're going to be you know, conducting the classes. So now everything is clear, right? Now, one more thing I just wanted to say, you know, say to everyone is that you are all more than welcome, more than required to please raise your queries in the chat box. Ask me if you're not able to understand something. I'll be more than happy to repeat it 10, 20, 50 times. I will not go ahead with the concept till the time it is actually clear with you. That is something which is very, very important. I, I, I don't like to rush my topics. I don't like to, you know, just very quickly uh, touch upon a topic and go on to the next one. No, we will be doing lots and lots of question practice in the class. We will be going through each and every concept. I will be showing you the important concepts with the help of some video, uh, you know, lectures as well. So that, you know, when we see videos, when we see conceptual, conceptual ideas coming to life in the form of videos, you're able to relate them better. So that becomes like a better retention in your head, really. So all of this I will be doing, but nonetheless, Anything that you want me to repeat, anything that you want me to still explain, please feel free to ask me to do that in the chat box. That is the only way the class will become fruitful to you when I know that everybody in the class has been able to grab the concept. One more thing I'd like to request everyone is to please try and make it to the live class. I know that, you know, sometimes you may have like a weekend plan for yourself one or two sessions here and there I can accommodate, but I would sincerely request everyone to be there in the live class so that you can ask your queries to me directly in the live class itself. Nonetheless, if you are, you know, you are um, you're not able to attend a particular class, all of it is going to be uploaded on the LMS, which you can watch and always reach out to me. I hope you all have been added to the WhatsApp group, subject specific, the FM WhatsApp group. You're all in there, right? Anybody in the class who has not been added as yet? So please, I'm just typing down a number. You have to reach out to this number and ask you to add in the FM group. I am in the group as well. Important messages will be circulated in this group so that we are all... <coughs> bear with me, please. So that we are all on the same page. Just bear with me. Let me just quickly rush for some water. Okay, apologies about that. So one more thing very quickly. What about books? Have you all ordered your books? I want everybody to have a physical book. So we will be following the BPP books. Please, you know, you can, you need to buy your physical books. Again, the contact person is Sandeep at VG Learning. So before the next class, please, everybody buy your physical books. Uh, ebook is something that you can avoid because I will be showing the ebook here in the class itself on the screen for you all you to have a look at. But please, I, I know I'm like, I'm like an old school teacher. I like my students having a physical book to read through the question, to do their markings, and then solve, you know, questions on the computer. So once you have the question here and then you're solving on the computer, it just makes it more um, easy for you to understand. That's what I personally feel. Otherwise, you can definitely go in for an ebook as well. Both are available. Please reach out to Sandeep at VG Learning and make sure that before the next weekend class, you all have your books on you. Because it will become difficult for you to just, you know, do questions like that. Okay? Any other doubt? Any other basic question that anybody wants to ask? Or shall we begin with having a look and feel of what 
the paper is. So I'm just going to very quickly introduce the financial management paper to you. So F9 paper is uh, the last of your skills level paper at your in your ACCA journey really, which means after this paper, you will be starting off with your professional level exam. So that simply means that you are expected to be like a near professional who is giving this paper. So this, this paper actually qualifies you to the professional level, right? So now, if you are being expected to hop onto the professional level after this paper, definitely the examiner is going to look and review whether you are actually skilled enough to act like a professional. So you don't write answers like a student. No, the way you're required to put down your answers is like a finance manager working in an organization. So put you, you have to put your down, put yourself, you know, down in the shoes of a finance manager, and only then you have to, you know, the, the language which you are using, the way you're presenting your answer, the way you're putting across your conclusions, everything must look like a finance manager working in an organization is portraying and not just, you know, somebody who is a student. No. So you are a near professional, you are a finance manager working in the organization and then answering your questions, right? Okay, so let's now very quickly hop on to the subject. So the aim of the subject is to develop skills and knowledge which would be expected of a finance manager in relation to what, what do you think you know, that you know a finance manager working at Reliance Industries would be doing? What kind of decisions or what kind of uh, roles and aspects would a finance manager be you know, looking into? Tell me. What sort of like decisions would you as a finance manager be taking? Tell me. Absolutely. So that would be like one of your major objectives is to maximize the shareholders' wealth. So that is like your ultimate objective. That is like your ultimate job responsibility to make sure that, you know, you are able to maximize shareholders' wealth. But I would actually put that down as one of the major key responsibilities of the management and not the finance manager. Managing finances, like taking decisions from which source... We finance taking dividend decisions. Absolutely, Udit. That's a very good point there. So as a finance manager, you're obviously a manager of finance, right? So you are looking at where the money is coming from, from which source the money is coming from. What are you doing with this money? So how, what, you know, where you're going to invest this money for this money to make more money for you ultimately. So you want to, you know, invest in profitable projects that is going to ultimately increase and give you like more money out of this money. And then what do you do with this money? It's ultimately the shareholders money that you've increased, right? So how do you give that, how do you give that money back to the owners, which is in the form of dividends? So what your major objectives your major kra as a finance manager in the organization is going to be looking at decisions with respect to financing so where the money is coming from investment decisions where the money is going to be invested and dividend decisions in the form of where the money is going to be you know how the money is going to be given away to the shareholders of the organization arushi says ma'am which skill level paper should we give at first Arushi, ACC gives you complete flexibility. You can definitely choose any paper within the skills level that you wish to appear for. It's a very personal choice. Being your first ACC paper, my only recommendation to you is that A, you can give any paper, but that one paper that you are choosing has to be on the basis of which paper you find to be the easiest. So I cannot actually tell you which paper is the easiest because all ACC level papers are difficult papers. But 
you know there are students who you who are more inclined towards taxation who find taxation an interesting subject so i would recommend them to start with taxation there are people who find costing to be like you know an interesting subject so going for costing there are people who would find you know financial management as the, as as a good subject to start off with so definitely you can choose depending upon what you are most comfortable with you as a person are most comfortable with why i recommend this so that your first experience is something which you can more resonate with which you are more you know fond of right right arushi and my one exam is left then i will give skills level exam so how much excel knowledge is required excel knowledge definitely is required because you will be appearing for the exam on the computer so very base uh, the structure of i will just show it to you in fact arushi in today's class itself i will show you the platform on which you will be appear for the exam a similar platform has been you know simulated by acc in the form of the acc practice platform on which you will have a you know a platform which simulates the real life exam so you will be given like a you know a spreadsheet kind of a document a word document kind of a document to put down your answers so yes you have to be familiar with your formats you have to be familiar you, know, you have to be um uh, you have to practice enough to be uh, a lot or oh, you know at ease with the prepare the exam needs to be submitted and that's precisely why i have already told you that no pen and paper is going to be used from today onwards right right arushi i am not ready to give taxation exam because i will attempt in march and taxation syllabus is going to change after march So which else I can choose? Just stick to FM. You're 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 fine here, right? Don't worry. I'm here to handhold you. Just but just keep following what I'm asking you to do. Wonderful. Okay. So from those of you who have come from the knowledge level, this paper is going to be a lot. You know, there will be a lot of brought forward knowledge being assumed at this level. On the basis of which you would have either you know cleared the paper or you actually have given like a relevant. a uh, qualification which you have already on you which has qualified you to be able to take this exemption so your ma paper from your uh, you know applied knowledge level is something that you should be familiar with now when i say you you know you need to have this broad forward knowledge it means that you should be familiar with the basic terminology you should be familiar with how to calculate basic ratios and all so in case any of you are not you know um uh, familiar with what ratio analysis is how to calculate basic ratios either i want you to change your subject or i want you to go back and revise those concepts because if you don't know the basic ratios the basic terminologies fm will not be doable by you is there anybody who doesn't know how to calculate ratios in the class anybody in the class who, who doesn't have you like any knowledge about what ratios are heard it for the first time never done it you uh, you've been exempt from your ma that's okay aryan the reason you've been exempt is because you would have done some uh, you know some other uh, qualification on the basis of which you would have got your exemption right yes i'm talking about ratio analysis financial ratios gearing ratios liquidity ratios i have the pick of ratio analysis no no i don't need a pick i have like an entire everything on me but have you done it udit have you ever attempted questions do you know how to calculate basic ratios exempt because of first semester i have done it in ca done it in fr pranka has done it well that so for those of you who have not done it what you need to do is you need to go back and revise your basic ratio analysis you could like do a basic youtube search and you know i try to understand basic ratios we will also be taking it up in the class but uh, yes you need you definitely need practice in it right so just in case any of you are not familiar with what ratios are please go back to the youtube channel and just you know just have a look at uh, what basic ratios are all about 
and at the professional level this paper is going to be linked to your advanced financial management level so this is how the hierarchy of the acca paper is uh, all ratios in fm chapter 1 no uh, it is not chapter 1 ode so basically i will come to it when we actually go down to it just don't you know don't try and fetch it from your fm book because here it would not be given in much detail what you need to go back to is probably your class 11 12th accountancy book and have a look at the basic ratios right okay so now let me make it very clear in terms of what is the expectation of the examining team do you know who is going to check your fm paper so the examining team very clearly expects you to perform so do some numbers but don't just stop at numbers they also want you to comment comment means what you should be able to add value you should be able to interpret what these numbers mean so you need to be able to perform calculations perform critical abilities demonstrate understanding of the syllabus which is there as well as use question information in the form of what is it that is expected from you so if you are able to understand this from today itself that this is what the examiner expects from me you obviously have the next two and a half months to groom yourself with these expectations calculations definitely required to be able to perform critical abilities to be able to analyze numbers to be able to understand and demonstrate the understanding of the entire syllabus as well as very important is to use the information which has been given in the question acc exams are going to be scenario based questions are going to be case study based questions so you what do you do with that case study do you just forget about it obviously not right you have to use a lot of information which has been given to you which has been told to you from the examiner so please use question information okay so let me just very quickly take you through this resource which is available from acca's website free of any charge and it's an extremely useful resource i'm just sharing it in the chat box with everyone as well so this is where you need to go down and read through all of this this is talking only about financial management the exam technique which you are required to do so i want everybody to go through these three articles these three resources which have been given here from acc examining team regarding your exam technique for fm now apart from this this particular page here is an extremely extremely important resource for you how many of you are seeing this page for the first time do you know these study support resources which acca gives to you so this page is like your go to page for not just your fm paper but every exam of acca let me just show it to you how to reach to that page okay so you type down accglobal.com go to students study support resources select the acca qualification whatever subject you are doing please choose that so like now we are doing fm so i'm just choosing fm this is your very very important tool for the paper you are supposed to read through each and every link which is here on this page this is where you can reach out to the accs practice platform as well some technical articles given some examiners report given exam technique all of this is very very important now what also it tells us is the pass percentage of the previous fm attempts 53 52 50 50 50 50 so very clearly across the globe the pass percentage of your fm paper is nearly averaging 50% which means only 50% of the students who actually appear for the exam are able to pass this paper what does that mean 
I'm not trying to intimidate you here, but I'm trying to, you know, tell you a, a strong heads up into what we are heading into and you how serious you really should be from today itself towards your paper to ensure that you are also, you are the one who is going to be, you know, in the past category. I am in AFM professional level. This lecture is also for me. No, Charika, unfortunately, you're in the wrong class. This is FM, not AFM. Please reach out to Sandeep in your uh, DG Learning to put you in the correct group and the correct class. Okay, Charika? Wonderful. So this is something that we are heading into. This is something that definitely means that you have to become heads on in terms of your preparation towards your F9 paper itself. Okay. So now let's have a look at what is the exam that we are heading into. But before that, I would just like to give you all a quick 10 minutes break so that you can all grab your water you can all grab your uh, quick um, you know breakfast if you just haven't had it so far and then we shall continue after 10 minutes okay everyone i hope everybody is back from the break let's now dive into what the exam is going to look like there was a query from arushi to show her the platform where we have skills level exam absolutely arushi just give me some time i'll reach out to the platform when my slide towards the platform comes in. So everything has already been planned. Don't worry, absolutely nothing will get left out in my exam preparation. So the exam which you are heading into, you must know it's a computer-based exam. It's a three-hour long exam. All questions are going to be compulsory, which is going to contain both computational as well as discursive elements to the questions. Some questions are going to adopt a scenario or a case study based approach as well. So which simply means that, yes, there are going to be three sections. Okay, let me go on down to the section wise. So you are required to bring, uh, you know, have some broad forward knowledge of MA basic ratios, basically, which that means all your calculations are required to have clear workings logical structure so that nothing is like a surprise to the examiner in terms of, okay, where did that you know, figure come from. No, you should be able to, you know, display and give away all information very, very clearly. Explain management accounting techniques and discuss their application to the question as well. You should be able to apply skills in a practical manner, showing what needs to be done when and where. Now, syllabus area is broken down into part A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now, the way I have jotted down here on the slide is starting from part B, C, E, F, G, A, and B. Why so? Why? Because this is in, in terms of the most important chapters and then going down to the chapters, which generally just only gets, you know, my, um, asked in section A and section B, which is like a two marker question. So, but that does not mean that you can ignore any part of the syllabus. This, this particular slide is not from the official ACCA website, but this is So that is why, you know, I put them right, right at the top that they're going to carry a lot more weightage. And then section A and B is going to be definitely split up amongst all the different, you know, parts of the, of the syllabus, right from part A to part G. So everything is going to be tested in your section A and section B, but obviously for a lesser number of marks as compared to your section C questions. So that is why I've penned it down like this. Okay, so section A is going to have your 15 objective test questions, which are going to be two marks each. Your section B is going to have three 10 marker case studies. These 10 marker question, uh, case studies are going to have, you know, five questions of two marks each within that particular scenario. So it's going to be like one scenario leading to five questions of two marks each. So that makes it 10 plus 10 plus 10 
30 marks for section B, 30 marks for section A, leaving out your 40 marks for section C, which is going to be two questions of 20 marks each and very predominantly being asked around part B, part C and part E of the syllabus in section C. And that's precisely why I had penned it down as like the most important syllabus areas. Okay. So like I said, section A and B can come from absolutely anywhere across the entire syllabus. You have to, have to, have to be familiar with absolutely every concept in the entire book of BPP that we will be going through. Now, section A is generally going to be like an MCQ kind of a question. So how do you approach these MCQs? There will be a stem given to you, which is like the question. There will be a key given to you, which is like the correct answer. And then there are going to be three distractors given in the question, which will be very attractive, you know, and they could look out as like a plausible answer, but you don't have to get distracted by the distractors because these are the incorrect answers, right? Any doubts till now? Any doubts? Guys, anything you want to ask? Please send me your doubts or your confirmations. All clear, good till now. What about others? I need everybody to either, you know, give me a doubt or give me a go ahead. Yes, Arushi, I will. Please wait. I told you, now I will. I will tell you the platform when I will come to that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all for your confirmation. So this is going to be about your section C. Definitely, you know, you can expect like a section like syllabus area C, syllabus area D, or a syllabus area E question here which is going to revolve around working capital management investment appraisal as well as business finance now one thing about the fm paper is that there will be a few formulas i'm saying a few formulas which will be given to you in the platform itself so you need not learn these formulas because they will be given to you but not all only a few formulas will be given to you on the formula sheet the others you have to learn also, bear with me, I think I just broke my tooth or something like that. Okay. Also, there will be, apart from the formula sheet, there will always also be a table of discount or an annuity table given to you. What all it means, I will show it to you on the platform. I will, you know, make you familiarize with you when we actually come down to that syllabus area, when we are actually, you know, on that topic. I'm just telling you the format of the exam for now then you are also required to bring along, along your scientific calculators to the exam. On the platform, a calculator is already inbuilt. Please don't open that. Already you will have, you know, many, many windows open on the computer exam. ACC exam allows you to carry physical calculators. So please do that. Please carry your own physical calculators to the exam. It should not be a calculator which has a memory function, but yes, scientific calculators are allowed. Okay. Okay. Time allocation. It's, it's a three hour exam, 100 marks. So that typically means 1.8 minutes per mark is what you have. So for a two marker question, you cannot go beyond 3.6 minutes. That means total section A, you have 54 minutes to attempt the whole of section A. If your 54 minutes have gone past, please drop dead your section A. Move on to the next section. That is something which is very, very important time management. Why? Because I don't want you to land up in a situation where you did not have ample time to focus on your section C. So please don't do that. Finish off your sections in the time given. If not, drop them. Move on to the next section. Very, very important. Right? Why don't we use calculator with memory function? Because that could lead to cheating, right? ACC is allowing you a facility, but ACC is not allowing you to cheat. So memory calculators with memory functions are not allowed. Right, Ashish? 
Okay, so section uh, B again is going to take 54 minutes, section A 54 minutes, meaning you are left with each question of section C, 20 mark question into 1.8, 36 minutes for each question and that's it. So you have to stick to this timeline if you want to pass your paper, you just cannot overrun on time and when i say you cannot overrun on time i am telling you this on the first day of our fm calculate no paper only that please be very very time specific spreadsheet also formula like npv irr yes you can make use of those spreadsheet formulas like npv irr how you make use of them ali I will show you when we actually reach down to that particular topic. But yes, you can use those formulas in your FM paper, right? So you need not calculate whole of it. You can just vote is equals to NPV, uh, select the windows and you're done with your question. We'll do that when we reach out to that topic. Right, Ali? Okay, so time management, extremely, extremely important. How to pass now, very important. We are all here to understand and prepare ourselves to pass, right? So let's get some things very, very clear on the first day itself. You have to understand theory. You should be able to apply the formulas. You should be able to interpret the requirement of the question. You have to have to do lots and lots of, you know, question practice on the practice platform in a timed environment to prepare yourself best for the exam, right? I hope that's okay with everyone. Now I'm just gonna show you the platform. So Arushi, this is for you. This is the ACCA's practice platform. I'm just gonna show you what an actual exam and the platform looks like. Let me just send it to everybody there. Arushi, one more thing I would like to request you that whenever you are putting down something in the chat box, send it to everyone so that everybody can read it because your query definitely could be somebody else's query as well, right? It's an open discussion. It's an open class, right? So don't address anything directly to me, but write to everyone, right? So that everybody can read your queries. Wonderful. So now let's very quickly open up the platform I have a look at what the exam is going to look like I'm just logging onto my account so this is one platform we just go to our catalog select our paper financial management here we have official resources from ACCA given, which has some past exam questions. So there are four past, actual past exam questions here for practice. Then you have some practice exams given by ACCA itself. You have some specimen exams given by ACCA. So you literally have three plus four, seven mock exams to do before you actually even think of, you know, booking your actual exam. So seven mock exams on the practice platform are an absolute bare minimum that you're required to be doing. Now, what I will do is I will very quickly take you through an actual exam. Obviously, we cannot be solving this actual exam as of now because we haven't done any of the concepts. But what I want you to have you know, a look at is an actual platform. Ashish says you can't log in. From where are you logging in, Ashish? Go to your My ACCA account. Log into your My ACCA account. And then there is practice platform link on your, on your ACCA account. You can just type in there with your own username and password for your ACCA account and you will be able to log in. Right, Ashish? Just check it, please, very quickly, everyone. Log on to your MyACC accounts. Open the tab of Practice Platform. Very quickly do this, everyone. I'll give you all a minute. I'll give you all a minute. I want everybody to log on to their MyACC accounts and open up their Practice Platform. 
let's you know do it simultaneously do it everyone i'm giving you all 2 minutes let me know when you've opened it i'll then start Come on, guys! Quickly log on. Let me know when you all opened up your practice platform. Drop a message in the chat box. Only then will I proceed further. Okay, let's review. Dan says Naman. Udit says logged in. Shivani, it's your demo class, so you don't have an ACS account. No worries, Shivani. Obviously, you don't have an account, then you obviously can't log in. Tanvi logged in. Rishita logged in. Can't find practice platform. Are you not opening? Why? Why, guys? Why is it not opening? Go to your ACS account. You all have your username and passwords for your MyACC account, right? Go to the qualification section, CBE practice platform. You should all be able to open it. Otherwise, on this ACCS website also, you have this this particular tab of practice platform just click on this log into practice platform so see it is again directing to you your acca account so this is exactly how you supposed to log in right i hope everybody has been able to do it now aryan and uh, uh, rajul now what about aryal and rajul now are you able to log in there is some technical issue it is now solved okay wonderful what about rajul guys you should be very, all familiar with this platform because this is exactly where you're going to do your question practice okay wonderful thanks guys thank you all for logging in so now you know where to and how to reach out to this particular practice platform what i'm going to do is just very quickly show you what an actual exam looks like so i'm just going to open up the june 22 fm paper this is an actual fm paper right so this is very much exam standard first thing you're going to get is this introduction sheet okay what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you all 5 minutes to please read through the sheet read through this introduction page please it's very important that you familiarize yourself with 
the practice platform with how it is similar to the actual exam how would you know what how some functionality is actually different from the actual exam so please read through this drop in a message in the chat box when you're finished reading this introduction slide very quickly everyone Okay, everybody's done reading. Okay, so now these are the four set of instructions which will be there on your actual exam as well. However, that is not going to be the first time that you're going to read through these instructions. I want you all to go through these instructions today itself so that you know what are the basic instructions in your exam. So there you are, everyone. These are the four set of instructions. Read through this, them, please. And also read through how the practice platform instructions or the functionality is going to be a little different from your actual exam. Please read through this page. Let me know when you're done. I will be showing you all of this functionality, but I want you to read through it first. Quickly, guys, read through it.
Okay, wonderful. So I have got a done from everyone. That's great. Read through the set of second page of instruction, please. So there is a help facility. There is a calculator function. There is a highlight and strike through functionality available. And you will be given a scratch pad or a working sheet. So now there's a very important thing here, which all of you should know is that for those who will be booking the exam at the center, you will be allowed a physical rough paper as well. But for those who will be appearing for the exam at uh, home, like under a remote invigilated exam, you will not be allowed to use a physical, uh, a physical rough paper. But what you will have to only use is a scratch pad functionality, which is like a working paper, which will be given to you on the platform itself. This scratch pad will not be accessed by the examiner. So anything which is written there, there on, the, on the scratch pad will not get marked. It's just like a rough paper for you. But like I've already told you, I would very, very strongly push everyone to please book their center-based exam. And what, this is one of the, uh, another advantage that you will get if you book for your center-based exam is that you will get this physical rough paper to, you know, scribble on and do your calculations upon. So quickly read through this. Done reading? Let me know when you're done reading. Few of you have done it. I'll just very quickly wait for the others. Okay, done. Wonderful.
Any doubts in any of this functionality in, in any of these instructions so far? Any doubts? Anything anybody would like to ask? Okay, wonderful. So then quickly read on the instruction sheet three. You have functionality like copy and paste. So you can control C, control V. You can select symbols. You can navigate through the screen. You can definitely close all the windows. And before you end your exam, you will be required to review your exam once. And you know, just look at the questions that you have attempted and what possibly is actually been left to flap for review at the end. Okay, so quickly go through the instruction sheet three, please. Very quickly, everyone. Okay, so done. That's just wonderful. Let's move on to the last set of instructions then, wherein you can review your item on item as in question on question, whether you've attempted the question, whether you've left it incomplete, whether you've completed it. And then after having reviewed your entire screen, what do you do? You will end your exam. Obviously, on the real exam platform, once you've ended your exam, you can never go back or revisit the same exam. However, in the practice platform, you can definitely, definitely, you know, revisit your paper. You can, in fact, self-mark your exam as well. How to do that also, I will let you know. Is that okay? Quickly read through the set of fourth page of instruction, everyone, quickly. Okay, so instructions done. This is the exam summary you all know. You have got your section C of 40 marks, section A and section B of 30, 30 marks each. Okay. Yes, we are ready to begin the exam. I'm only showing you what the exam looks like. 
It is only have straight hopped on to your section C question only. I don't want to show you only a section C question, but I want to show you like a full fledged exam. Let me go back to another question paper, which is going to show you your um, section A and section B both. Okay, just let me very quickly open up. Let me see that if this particular question has it. Yep, so this is section A, 30 marks, section B, 30 marks, section C, 40 marks. Yes, we are ready to have a look at the exam. So this is going to be a section A comprising of 15 objective test questions. And this is the kind of questions you are going to be asked. So you will have like, you know, a pick one option kind of a question. You will have, again, pick one question. So this is something which is asking you to put down the answer to two decimal places. So please, for God's sake, put down the answer to two decimal places only. If time lapse and did not uh, click on end, it will automatically submit it or cancel exam. No, it will automatically submit your exam, Priyanka, don't worry, right? It doesn't cancel your exam. It will just submit whatever you have done so far. Okay. And you have another, you, you could, could be required to do like a pick and a true and a false kind of an option. These are also the kind of questions that you will be asked. You could be required to select from a drop down. I'm just like randomly picking up. I'm not even reading the questions. I'm just going to make you show what kind of questions are you going to be tested. So again, select, select questions can come in section A. You could be required to answer something to two decimal places here. So please put down your answer to two decimal places. So supposingly, I just put down in one decimal place. See, the, the, ex, the platform is telling me that my answer is not matching the expected platform. Why? Because I was required to answer to two decimal places. Again, select one option. I'm just like randomly picking up, guys. I'm not selecting the right option. I'm just showing you the kind of questions you will be tested. So again, the question, and then you have to choose one right answer in the MCQ. False, true, you have to pick up. So just select, select, select. I'm just showing you the kind of questions that can be tested. Mark correct, incorrect. This is how you choose. This is how you go ahead. Remember, no more than 2 into 1.8, no more than 3.6 minutes on any of these questions. So this is what a typical section A exam is going, you know, paper is going to look like. Any doubts in the kind of questions that you will be tested in section A? Any doubts? I only showed you the actual exam just to make you, you know, I give you like a heads up into what kind of questions are going to be tested. What about others? I want everybody to either ask a query or give me a go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you guys for your confirmation. Okay. So section B is going to have three case studies of 10 marks each. Each case study is going to have five questions. So this is the case study on your left. So you have to scroll up and down here. You can also scroll left and right like this to, you know, navigate the screen. So like you may want the question on a bigger form and just the uh, question to select here. So you can definitely go through it. What you could also do is you could highlight something, you could strike through something which you feel is irrelevant. You could open up the calculator like this. There are different modes in the calculator. So that's a scientific calculator. That's a standard calculator. You can choose whatever 
calculator you want to do your workings upon i personally want you all to do it on your physical calculators and this is the rough paper given to you so what you can also do is it's going to show you some of the working so control c control v also works on the platform right copy paste okay with everyone this functionality anything that you write here in the scratch pad will not be marked by the examiner okay so there is a question on the left followed by one question on the right same question on the left followed by one more question on the right remember one scenario is going to have five questions same question on the left followed by one more question on the left on the right i'm just like randomly choosing answers guys don't judge me and my knowledge here <laughs> i'm just showing you the kind of questions that you're going to be required to answer right we're not even going through the question we're not doing anything technical here just knowledge knowledge of what we are heading into right your answer to two decimal places i choose to ignore the platform gives me a prompt that you are not putting your answer in the correct format okay so five questions done next question on your left followed by question number 1 on your right same question on your left followed by question number 2 third question just keep doing whatever the question requires you to do same question pick the correct answer on the right question on the left answer on the right now five questions done in comes in your third case study of your section b read through the question do each of these five questions on the right based upon the scenario on the left is this okay with everyone section b questions kind of questions you can expect kind of layout you can expect any doubts in this please feel free to ask before i show you what a section c question looks like okay with everyone thank you guys for your confirmation okay section c two scenarios of 20 marks each totaling up to 40 marks in all this is the scenario and this is the kind of response sheet that will open up now remember i told you that the examiner is going to give you the formulas which you need not learn so these are the set of formulas which will be given to you in the exam so you need not actually learn these formulas however one thing to note here is that only the formula is given like the acid beta formula is given but what what is this ve what is this vd what is t what is beta e nothing is given to you right so for that you obviously need knowledge so even if the formula is given to you you should be able to read and interpret and apply the formula also the discount tables will be given to you here the annuity tables and the discount tables when do we make use of these i will let you know when we come to that subject topic right but this is your formula sheet given to you some typical help questions given to you i want you all to just read through these please everybody spare out some time and read through this as part of your homework today right so you go on to constructed response question help you read on to all of this functionality before you come for tomorrow's class is that okay with everyone do you all understand your homework does everybody understand their homework So the homework for today is to read through the constructed response 
question and help guide so that you know what is it that we are heading into right okay so this is typical section c question so you have obviously have to scroll up and down to read the entire question and boom what comes in what is this what does what kind of a uh, you know answer sheet is this tell me this is a constructed response spreadsheet like an excel it's not excel it doesn't replicate all functionality of excel but it is very much like excel right so you will be able to use some basic formulas you want to use some basic formulas like we do in excel you will very much be able to do it here right and the only thing which you are required to do here is that you that is going to you know make you familiar with this is practice that's why no more pen and paper either you open up your excel in the class or i will show you one more thing that you can do in the class let me just finish off this paper so this particular question has a, a you know a theory question is there so you have to explain the meanings of the term business risk and finance risk boom what comes in a word like document on which you can type in your answer business risk so i'm just going to put that up as a header i'm going to bold it i'm going to underline it i'm going to just go down remove these functionalities business risk is the risk associated with blah 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 so this is exactly how you're supposed to write your theory questions is that okay with everyone again there is a question that requires you to write down a theory question so in comes in your word like document okay so things that i have not gone through the entire question which obviously i have not actually require some calculations in comes in your spreadsheet can we select text case in word also yes absolutely you can select text right so there you are this is your typical exam of your financial management these are the typical kind of questions that you are going to be tested upon and these are the response sheets will be given to you depending upon what you have to do in the question as you can very well see that a lot of question is theory based question so please i'm requesting you all in the first lecture of your fm excel not to ignore theory bits if you want to pass your fm paper with your calculations your your game on your word on your theory has to be equally strong right it's not allowing me to scroll down it feels i have not gone through the question which i obviously have not so let me just try and navigate through okay dear what is left what is left what is left Okay, it keeps prompting, prompting me that I have not gone through the entire question, which I obviously have not as of now. So it's just trying to help me. No want help right now. Thank you very much. I'm done. Okay, so this is the item by item review screen, which I told you. Okay, my battery is running low. I need to run for my charger. should we make our notes also um as an rn okay i think what you are trying to ask is that for theory 
are in everything will be given to you so this is i will just show it to you right so this is like my notes for my chapter 1 i have already mentioned absolutely everything and these will be given to you as part of my notes to you so you need not jot down anything you need not make your own notes you will be given everything from my end but all you really need to do is follow what i'm asking you to do right aryan so theory concepts everything will be given to you but yes you need question practice okay i'm just going to quickly reach out for my charger meanwhile this is the item review screen we've done these questions we could happy to end my exam yes i want to end and done so this is how i have already submitted my exam this is obviously because it's a practice platform you will be able to go back and mark your exam so go under marking under self marking select the subject and the paper that you've just attempted and you can then just self mark it right so this is the steps you need to follow the paper the the section a and section b gets checked automatically by the system itself section c you can self mark just click here to see the sample answers and you are done so this is how the sample answer shows up right everyone any doubts in this anything anybody would like to ask here any doubts guys okay let's take a quick 10 minutes breather then and then we shall continue guys ma'am is not on mute it was a 10 minutes break given to you now am i audible okay wonderful okay so some queries there let me just very quickly address them uh could you please help from where we can get bpp f9 books so rohit i am just dropping the name and the number again of the concerned person in the chat box at pg learning so please reach out to the team for physical books for e books for notes for lms for everything right okay so now let me quickly take you through some of the exam tips for you to be able to pass your fm paper obviously you have to start without pen and paper from today itself you have to do absolutely no there is no need for beautifying your scratch pad it's a rough paper which will not be seen by the examiner so just very quickly scribble through your rough sheets you have to definitely cover all the topics in your uh, book there is going to be no selective study your section a and section b questions can be asked from absolutely anywhere across the syllabus the idea is one idea gives you one mark ideally so you have to definitely focus on quality over quantity for your uh, mcq questions the rule of elimination can be worked out you definitely need to answer every mcq question because there is going to be no negative marking so first of all if you don't know anything just take a fluke and you know just mark one of the options there is 25% probability that you still probably you know hit the right answer but don't leave any question unattempted there is an own figure rule which means that not everything is going to be dependent on the final answer you will gain marks as you move along in your workings for your subjective answers definitely you have to use headers with small paragraphs there's absolutely no two ways about it who why you guys can't hear me 
uh, there's someone in the name of user so what you have to do is you have to go on to your um, to your system and press on audio and use computer audio yes so i don't know who you are in the name of user this is how you will be able to hear me everyone else can oh you can't hear me why why am i saying okay done thank you wonderful okay so how to make use of the cbe functionality first of all get this straight in your head that it is much easier to do fm paper on computer than it was on no on, on the computer than it was on the paper so yes make use of the functionality make use of the key features available to you so that you know you are able to pass make very very clear and labeled reference to workings for yourself your calculations should be something that are easy to follow and understand rather than you know some figure being show thrown onto your screen out of the blue which the examiner will not be able to make out from where you got that figure your layouts have to be clear and sensible obviously you definitely can make use of formulas like sum irr npv that you know that will make your life easy and please do not just write you know your calculations and forget about it you have to write comments you have to add value to the numbers which you have done right okay so some quick tips this is something that we've already discussed many times but i want you to quickly spare out a minute to read through them quickly go through the top tips section wise i've already discussed it in detail but i still want you to read it once please very quickly okay so section a done yes in the name of user please ask your question please drop in your question in the chat box please change your name i would like to address my students as their with their name rather than the name of user please um, please ask your question in the chat box drop down okay meanwhile the question is coming up i want you all to quickly read through the tips for your section b question as well do uh, ma'am you do notes in excel notes it will always be in the ppt format but we'll do question practice in excel right so if a question requires calculations we'll open up our excel worksheets and we'll do question on excel wonderful quickly read through your section b please tip top tips for your section b top tips for your section c we have already discussed it but i want you to very quickly read through it please yes very very important is to please improve your narrative areas work upon your theory answers most of the you know time that students fail their fm exam is not because of the calculations part but because of poorly written theoretical answers so we will be concentrating a lot on your theoretical questions the way you are presenting your answer right okay so this is a key message to all the students not from me but right from the examining team of acca for your fm paper please address the requirements use the self formula correctly present the spreadsheets as professionally as you would do in your office plan your word process responses guided by the requirements both in terms of content as well as details of response a short a list of short bullet points is definitely not a discussion so if you've been asked to do a discussion please discuss rather than just giving you know five bullet points for an answer that is definitely not a discussion right 
Okay, so let me just show you the list of technical articles. So we are on the student support guidance again. These are the technical articles which are available to you. You have to read each of these technical articles. These are the technical articles which are in relation to each of the subject area, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Under each, you will have a few articles. And definitely, this is something which will help you enhance your narrative answers. Right? So please, I am just dropping it in the chat box, the link for these technical articles. These are over and above your BPP books. You have to read through these articles to be able to enhance your theoretical answers. And believe you me, that could very well be a difference between your pass or a fail. Right? Okay, so that actually finishes off the introduction of our FM paper. Any doubts? Anything anybody would like to ask? Because then I would start with your topic number one, with your chapter number one of your FM paper. Any doubts? Please, guys, give me either your query or your go ahead. Very quickly, I'll wait for everybody, everybody's response. Okay. Thank you all very much for your confirmations. We can officially now start our session one on your financial management curriculum. The first topic is going to be revolving around, obviously, the financial management function. So what is it about the subject? Why is it that we need to study financial management? What is the role of a finance manager in any organization? So this is like just gonna like going to set the tone of all the topics that are going to be following this particular topic. So definition wise, I think we've already discussed it, right? Financial management is all about the management of activities which will be associated with the efficient acquisition, how you are acquiring both your short-term as well as long-term funds, as well as not just only acquiring them, how you are putting them to use, how and where you are investing them. And then once this investment reaps you further, you know, further profits, what do you do with that capital? How do you pay back the owners of the organization, which are the shareholders in the form of dividends? So that is all that is prima, prima facie, the role of the finance management. And this is what you will be studying as a subject here as well. So the management of the finances of an organization in order to achieve the financial objectives of the organization is called financial management right so what kind of firm what kind of you know what type of time genre are we talking about so yes you know you need to take care of finances you need to plan for your finances but yes you need to take care of your financial needs of an organization at all levels which includes the short-term funds which obviously will be you know catering to majorly your working capital requirements your medium-term funds, which will primarily be parked in the form of non-current assets, as well as your long-term capital needs, which could be funded with the form of long-term debt that you are taking or giving away as an organization. So yes, you need to plan to ensure that you have the right amount of money at the right amount of time. And that is precisely what the work of a finance manager is going to be in the organization to take care of your short, medium, as well as long-term finance requirements, right? So decisions, we all know now, finance manager is going to take care of your finance and decisions in terms of where the money is going to be raised from. Are you going to take debt capital? Are you going to take equity capital? where this you know where this race money is going to be invested so you will be you know doing uh, analysis of the various proposals available you could you know follow techniques like npv irr to find out which out of the many options available to you as you know as options 
where should you actually be investing the funds in? Should you go in for project A? Should you go in for project B? So yes, investment decisions will be taken care of, but you know, taken care by you as well as dividend policy decisions, wherein you are looking at how much dividend should be paid to the shareholders of the organization. How this dividend is going to be paid in terms of how much are you going to pay away as dividend? How much are you going to retain as retained earnings in the organization to be taken, you know, to be taking care of your future requirements of an organization, right? What about types of decisions? Obviously, as a finance manager, you will be taking decisions in terms of you know, factors or decisions which are very much internal to the business itself, which would, you know, probably mean what kind of projects we need to invest in, where the money needs to be invested in, uh, how much are you spending on research and development, how much are you spending on buying new plant and machinery, how much are you investing in a marketing or an advertising campaign, maybe. You have to look at decisions which involve external parties in an organization, which includes whether, you know, you need to carry out or take over or a merger, whether, you know, you need to engage in terms of a joint venture, probably. So somebody, your decision with an external party that how you know, what sort of decisions are you collating upon, as well as not just investment, but also very important finance decisions are going to revolve around withdrawing money are going to involve around disinvestment decisions as well. So how am I selling off something which is unprofitable to the business, whether you know you are looking at selling the surplus or some old planted machinery, what are you doing with this you know disinvested funds? Are you reinvesting them back into the organization? Are you giving them away as dividends? All of these are going to be revolving around your critical investment as well as disinvestment decision. So both is what you will be taking in the organization as a finance man manager, definitely involving with decisions which are internal to the business as well as decisions which are external to the business as well. Right? Is that okay with everyone? Any doubts here? Any doubts, guys, please feel free to ask. Thank you for your confirmation. What I would like you to now do is, ever heard of the word management accounting? Anybody knows the difference between financial accounting and management accounting? Tell me. So any, any point of difference that you can tell? Who is it addressed to? What all it encompasses? Is it something which is like legally required to prepare management accounts or is it discretionary? Management accounting is for internal people. So it's primarily, you know, some reports, some MIS that you're preparing for the management to be able to take informed decisions. Whereas what is financial accounting? Yes, it is for external people it is for people who are the shareholders of the organization who are the real owners of the organization what else ashi says it follows accounting standards in case of financial accounting but it is not with management accounting yes so management accounting is a set of management reports which you can prepare you know in terms of what do what kind of information do you really you know need to be able to make informed decisions as management but in terms of financial management, there is definitely a set protocol. There are set rules which you need to follow. Financial account is, is compulsory. It's legal. It's, you know, you are required to prepare financial accounts by law. However, my management accounting is definitely discretionary. Right, Aryan? What else? Management accounting, I think it mostly covers like, you know, finance and like money related matters, isn't it? However, for your management accounting, you could be concentrating or getting a report prepared on a parameter which is non-monetary really, right? Financial accounting is definitely looking at the past in terms of what has already happened. However, management record you know, accounting could be 
preparing forecasts and that could be like you know a future driven tool as well for the management i am just going to very quickly show you a quick video the way i like to take my classes is not just in a boring theoretical manner where i am just doing the chit chatting you guys are just chit chatting via the chat box no we'll more make it more interactive we'll make the topics come to life with the form of these very useful and small videos related to the topic so quickly go through this In this video, you'll discover the similarities between managerial accounting and financial accounting. Then I'll give you five major differences that separate these two practices. Okay, this one is not required. It's a pretty long one. I only show small videos that actually add kind of life to the topic that we are talking about. Okay, so is everyone clear with the difference between management accounting and financial accounting? Everyone clear? Wonderful. So let's proceed then and have a look at that. As a finance manager, you obviously have to prepare your strategy. What is strategy? Strategy is like an action plan, right? It's a course of action which you need to be able to do anything, right? So, like. if your aim today is to pass your fm paper in the last two hours what we've done we've only discussed strategy isn't it we've only discussed what we're going to do how we're going to do to be able to pass our papers so similarly to achieve anything to achieve any management goal to achieve any you know objective of the organization you need strategy you need a course of action you need an action plan in terms of how the organization you know endeavors or uh, you know uh, looks at achieving a particular topic and that strategy will be broken down into corporate level strategy business strategy as well as operational or functional strategy as we call it so right at the top then the second level and then right at the bottom you have the operational or the functional stuff all at all levels your strategy must be moving in the same direction to be able to achieve the ultimate objective that you have set for you as an organization strategy and plan there's no difference as such udit so strategy is a plan basically how do you you know it's like a course of action how do you intend to achieve something there is no technical difference between the two 
Okay, so now you tell me what kind of objectives do you reckon an organization can have? What could be the possible organizational objectives as an organization? So you choose any organization, say Alliance Industries. What do you think would be their you know, organizational objectives? Tell me. What, you know, what is it that they want to achieve? No problem there. Increase in sales. Yes, increase in sales would basically mean increase in their market share. Profits, definitely yes. What else? What else could be objective of an organization? Yes, make more profits. What else? I only wanted to ask you that it is available in recording. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand your question. The lectures will be available. So the, this after the session, the same will get uploaded on the LMS. To increase the brand value, yes, that's right. To provide competent services, absolutely right. To, you know, to provide a product or service which is better than the competition really, right? What else could be an objective? Building a good image in society, yes. What else? Building good customer relationships, absolutely, yes. So good customer satisfaction, has, you know, absolutely has to be one of your organizational objectives. What else? What about, you know, having a good and a contented Workforce, customer loyalty, yes. Employee loyalty, yes. Your concern towards the environment at large. You know, a lot of firms are going organic. A lot of firms are giving it back to the society in which we operate because that is obviously something that has, you know, become a very important concern across the globe. So yes, these are all the different organizational objectives that an organization would be having. Yes, absolutely, you know, building and producing sustainable products to be able to sustain the resources in our ecosystem. Improving the work culture, absolutely, yes. So yes, these are some of the organizational objectives that an organization will typically have. Now, Obviously, one of the most important factors or objectives, you know, which everybody said in the first place was to increase the shareholders' wealth maximization. So how do you think we can calculate whether the shareholders' wealth has maximized or increased or not? So there are two methods which you could use. First is the statement of financial position. That is the balance sheet valuation where all the assets will be valued at a going concern basis and the parameter that we are judging here is whether the retained profits of the organization have increased or not if yes the overall shareholders wealth has maximized then you could also make use of the breakup basis wherein the entire business you know is being threatened by liquidity so you really don't know whether you will be able to continue at the going concern or not so here how you value this particular business is looking at how much worth or how much would you literally get if you would sell off each of your individual assets to raise cash. So that also is one of the methods in which you can calculate the wealth of your shareholders. How to uh, how breakup basis maximize shareholders wealth. It doesn't maximize, it just tells you what is the shareholders wealth. So if it has increased, it has maximized. If it has decreased, your shareholders' wealth is decreasing, right? This is just a way to calculate your shareholders' wealth. Right, Uday? So when you compare it to your previous year position, that is when you will be you know, able to judge whether you are able to maximize shareholders' wealth or not. Also, you could look at the market values, which is the most common way of calculating the shareholders' wealth, which is calculating your total shareholder returns. This is the first formula that you all need to know 
in your financial management paper is to calculate total shareholder return, which is P1, that is the share price at the end of the period, minus P0, which is share price at the beginning of the period, plus the recent dividends given divided by P0, which is the share price at the beginning of the period, right? So this is exactly how you calculate your shareholders return. I want you all to give yourself a minute to read through the formula. We will be doing questions on this, but read through the formula and understand the formula. So your share price at the end of the year minus your share price at the beginning of the year plus the recent dividends which have been given here divided by the share price at the beginning of the year will tell you the total shareholder return. Right. Now, a lot of you said that one of the key objective of the organization is to maximize profits, right? Do you really think just looking at profits, just looking at profits as a you know core parameter, is it the right thing to do for an organization? I think Ashish has just answered my question already. Is that in case of rise in retained profits, profits can be manipulated also, so it is correct way to judge shareholders wealth maximization. Yes, because profits per se are definitely something which are prone to manipulation. Um, Aryan says, ma'am, company going into liquidation indicates decrease. Yes, absolutely, Aryan. So you will see when you calculate your shareholders wealth based on the breakup basis, you will see that it is decreasing, right? And that's precisely why the company is going into liquidation. Okay, so now tell me why profits are not the best measure of a company's performance. Tell me quickly, why are we just not only focusing upon profits? It's related to past, it's prone to manipulation, it can be window dressed. Absolutely good points there by the class. And profits, Arben, is it like a long-term vision? No, it's definitely a short-term performance evaluator, right? So you have to look at the long-term vision of the organization and not just the short-term objective of the organization. Maybe profits include one-off events which may not occur in the next year. Yes, absolutely. So yes, just looking at profits cannot be your criteria of judgment whether the organization has performed well or not. Okay with everyone? Okay, so what we should have instead is Yes, Zishan, that wealth maximization should be our ultimate objective, not profit maximization, but increasing the ultimate shareholders. Wealth instead should be our focus. So now let's have a look at calculating the wealth of the shareholder in terms of the earnings per share. So what you're doing here is that you will be calculating by dividing the net profits or losses which are attributable to the ordinary shareholders by the weighted average number of ordinary shares in the business. So how do you calculate your EPS? You take your profit after tax, which is your PAT levels, minus any preference dividends, which still obviously needs to be paid out because that is something which is mandated. You are then left with profits which are attributable only to your of equity shareholders divided by the number of equity shares that you have, you get your earning per share. Is everyone okay with EPS? I hope you've all done it. This is just like a revision of what you already should be knowing of. I will be doing questions on this. Don't worry to, you know, to brush and revise your concept. Wonderful. However, any, any, Drawbacks you can still figure off in terms of your EPS. Is it still not only based on past already earned profits? Is it still not prone to manipulation? Absolutely it is, isn't it? So the drawbacks still remain the same. If there are irredeemable debentures, then we deduct interest, uh, then we deduct interest after tax. Yes, absolutely you do. You you first take off your 
any you know fixed uh, debt that is there any interest commitment that is there any commitment towards your preference dividend shareholders also needs to be knocked off you only need to be left with only the part of the profits which is only attributable to your equity shareholders there are all other fixed commitments have already been given away with right udit okay so apart from this your other financial targets could include you know maintaining your gearing levels gearing level is what what is the gearing level of an organization how do you calculate gearing liquidity ratios debt upon equity yes so there yes priyanka wonderful what about your targets for profit retention in terms of how much are you giving away as dividends and how much are you retaining as profits target for operating profitability which would be your return on your capital employed again something which you all are already familiar with okay so this is just all about your financial targets so far do you think any organization should only be focusing upon financial targets or is it important for organizations to focus on non financial objectives as well and if yes what are the various non financial objectives that you can think of yes aryan so tell me few non financial objectives which are so very critical for the long term success of the organization your employees growth yes what else work life balance of employees very important what else so you obviously need to think of the welfare of employees the welfare of your management csr activities corporate social responsibility yes society welfare yes compliance with law very important yes what about you know your uh, your uh, you can say you know what 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 responsibility are you accepting towards your uh, your customers at large towards your suppliers at large towards the entire supply chain that you are dealing with that is also very important right after sales service very important yes so what kind of uh, you know responsibility are you acknowledging towards your customers diversification yes what else leadership do you think that is something which is required leadership as well as you know a uh, correct investment in research and development do you think it's it's required because ultimately your r and d is what is going to the you know determine what what future is going to be like do you actually recognize what kind of huge volumes of investment does you know companies like apple do into their r and d you uh, know departments why because it's it's purely based upon what next what level of you know technology what is the next one level up that we can actually offer to our customers and the entire business model is just only based upon that so every year the new iphone comes in what are the new features what are the what is the new technology new technology that has kicked in so these are all non financial objective yes absolutely phones are still the same isn't it r and d means research and development it's a short form for research and development okay so now i just want you all to very quickly revise the basic ratios this is something that you all should already be aware of but i want you all to give yourself 5 minutes to revise through the basic ratios quickly read through it let me know when you finished reading okay everybody seems to have revised okay question is it current capital liabilities yes that's what it means 
We're looking at your liabilities. Okay, there you are. Quickly revise your ratios. Very quickly, everyone. I'm just giving you five minutes to be able to brush up with what is presumed to be your broad forward knowledge in your FM paper. Please do that very quickly. Let me know when you've finished reading. And also please ask if you have absolutely any doubts. And uh, it's a very, very strong advice from my end. If there's any particular ratio you're not very familiar with, please, it's a good time at the beginning of the session itself to go back and revise. Okay, revise guys, any questions, any doubts, any ratio that you're probably hearing for the first time, which obviously should not be the case, but any doubt, any particular ratio you want me to read through, explain again, Wonderful. So now we all know that for a profit organization, for a profit maximization pro, you know, organization, for a private organization, the objective is obviously shareholders wealth maximization. However, what about not for profit organization? What do you reckon would be like, you know, the objective of an organization, which is, as the name says, not for profit. So clearly profit cannot be their target, right? So what do you think would be an organization like a charitable organization, a trust organization? What would their you know, objective be like? Tell me. What do you think would be the objective of a not-for-profit organization? A service, yes, a public service, a social service for which it has been set up in the first place, right? Social welfare, social service, attaining best resource at the lowest cost. Yes, absolutely. Social welfare to cater to the needs of the specific region of society that the target uh, is there and why it was actually, you know, set up in the first place, isn't it? So there's a uh, not-for-profit profit organization, which is like an orphanage. So obviously their objective would be to take care of, uh, of, you know, of kids who are orphans, right? So that is obviously the social benefit for which it was set up in the first place. Then you have to do that well. You have to do that properly. There has to be, you know, uh, whatever objective you had set up for, whatever clientele you had set up for, that clientele needs to be satisfied obviously you have to look at that you are able to bring on board more and more people to be able to avail the services that you're offering so usage maximization will also be one of your objectives to cater to the needs of the specific reason of the society that the target was that's right Aryan. And he says using subscriptions and donations properly. Yes, absolutely. So you had set up your, you know, not for profit organization in an orphanage so that you can take care of orphan kids and you are collating, you know, donations and subscriptions and charities and grants for that particular target. And then you just go in and, you know, do a, yourself a party with that, all that money. Is that right? Obviously not, right? You have to make sure that you are utilizing the funds in the way they should be. Okay, so Realme RMX3430 has raised hand. I request you to please drop in your query in the chat box so I can read your query out, out and about loudly for everyone to read your query and then I'll answer. So everybody, please, I will not be able to unmute any of you in the class, but I want everybody to make use of the chat box functionality Drop in your query so that I can read it out loud for everybody else to be able to understand. And then I will answer. So real me, please drop in your query in the chat box. Meanwhile, what we will do is we'll very quickly have a look at not-for-profit organizations. I'm just dropping in, in the link in the chat box.
okay let me just turn on the subtitles go on full screen and we start A non-profit organization, NPO, also known as a non-business entity, is an organization the purpose of which is something other than making a profit. A non-profit organization is often dedicated to furthering a particular social cause or advocating for a particular point of view. In economic terms, a non-profit organization uses its surplus revenues to further achieve its purpose or mission rather than distributing its surplus income to the organization's shareholders or equivalents as profit or dividends. This is known as the distribution constraint. The decision to adopt a non-profit legal structure is one that will often have taxation implications, particularly where the non-profit seeks income tax exemption, charitable status and so on. The terms non-profit and not-for-profit are not consistently differentiated across jurisdictions. In layman's terms they are usually equivalent in concept, although in various jurisdictions there are accounting and legal differences. The non-profit landscape is highly varied, although many people have come to associate and pose with charitable organizations. Although charities do make up an often high-profile or visible aspect of the sector, there are many other types of non-profit organization. Overall, they tend to be either member-serving or community-serving. Member-serving organizations include mutual societies, cooperatives, trade unions, credit unions, industry associations, sports clubs, retired servicemen's clubs and peak bodies, organizations that benefit a particular group of people that is the members of the organization. Typically, Community-serving organizations are focused on providing services to the community in general, either globally or locally, organizations delivering human services programs or projects, aid and development programs, medical research, education and health services, and so on. It could be argued many nonprofits sit across both camps, at least in terms of the impact they make. For example, the grassroots support group that provides a lifeline to those with a particular condition or disease could be deemed to be serving its members by directly supporting them and the broader community through the provision of a service for fellow citizens. Many MPOs use the model of a double bottom line in that furthering their cause is more important than making a profit, though both are needed to ensure the organization's sustainability. Although MPOs are permitted to generate surplus revenues, they must be retained by the organization for its self-preservation, expansion, or plans. NPOs have controlling members or a board of directors. Many have paid staff including management, whereas others employ unpaid volunteers and executives who work with or without compensation occasionally nominal. In some countries, where there is a token fee, in general it is used to meet legal requirements for establishing a contract between the executive and the organization. Designation as a non-profit does not mean that the organization does not intend to make a profit, but rather that the organization has no owners and that the funds realized in the operation of the organization will not be used to benefit any owners. The extent to which NPO can generate surplus revenues may be constrained or use of surplus revenues may be restricted. What up crowdfunders? Okay, so that was a quick heads up in terms of your not-for-profit organization. Now let's have a look at how do we measure the performance of not-for-profit organizations? Obviously, because profit was not the criteria of these organizations in the first place, you cannot measure profits. You cannot, you know, measure them in terms of whether they are a success or a failure in terms of how much profits they have made because that is obviously not the objective for which they were formed in the first place. So we use the three E's model, three E's as in economy, 
efficiency and effectiveness as our three E's for measuring the performance of not for profit organization. So getting the best com possible combination of services from the least resources that we have is, is what is how you're able to produce your products most economically. Minimizing the input cost of the organization is achieving economy. Achieving efficiency simply means that you are able to maximize the output, divide by the input in terms of how much output are you able to produce from this limited input which was given to you. So that maximizing that ratio is how efficient you have been in your performance. And effectiveness simply means that whether you've been able to achieve the objective for which you were set up in the first place. So the three E's criteria is our criteria for the measurement of performance of not-for-profit organizations. Economy, least cost. Efficiency, maximum output in least cost. Effectiveness is achieving the objective for which you were set up in the first place. Okay with everyone? Yes, Ashish, that's right. Are the three E's of NPO okay with everyone? As soon as, you know, in the exam, you get a question on a not-for-profit organization, you have to talk about the performance, please make use of the three E's model to judge and evaluate the performance of the company. Right? Is everybody okay with the three E's? I want your answers. I want your queries. Economy, efficiency, effectiveness. It could very well be asked as a two marker question as well. So you need to know the performance criteria for not for profit organization, the three E's. Okay. Can you speak again? Yeah, absolutely, Hari. So we are talking about the, the how do we measure the performance of not-for-profit organizations. So we will be making use of the three E's criteria. Economy means let's the, the, the not-for-profit organization should aim to get its inputs, its resources, which it requires at the least possible cost. Efficiency means that whatever inputs it has got at the least possible cost, they should be able to, you know, push maximum output out of those inputs. And effectiveness means that whatever objective the not-for-profit organization was set up for, that objective should be met. They should be able to meet that particular objective. Right, Hari? Is that okay now? Wonderful. We will be doing questions on it as well, don't worry. Before that, I want you all to tell me what do you understand by the term stakeholders? I'm not talking about shareholders. I'm talking about a much wider term, which is stakeholders. Who are stakeholders? Tell me, give me a few examples of stakeholders of an organization. Tell me quickly. Who do you think are stakeholders? All concerned people affected by the organization's activities are its stakeholders. Wonderful, Aryan. So all people who are internal to the organization, who are external to the organization, or who are somehow connected to the organization form part of its stakeholder groups. Related to the organization by any means, yes, be it internal, external, or just connected to the organization. Let me first show you a quick video on this. I've just shared the link in the chat box. I will show you a quick video as well just to understand the terms. Stakeholders in business. Very small videos is what I choose just to keep it entertaining. Presented by Reduxit.com. In this video, we are going to enlist stakeholders in business. 
Stakeholders refer to different segments in the society who have direct impact on the business decision making process and can directly impact the marketing performance of the business. Various groups that fall into the category of stakeholders are as follows. Clients or customers, community groups, employees or staff, financial institutions, government, local communities, media, shareholders, strategic partners. Maintaining good public relations with all the stakeholders help the company to increase the goodwill and in turn will help in improving the business through referrals. That covers the enlisting of stakeholders. Thanks for watching. Edixit.com is started to promote effective and efficient learning. Okay, so that was about stakeholders. Yes, we know people who are internal to the organization, like the employees of the organization, the management itself, the managers, the directors, they are all internal stakeholders. Then you have people who are you know, somehow connected with you. They are not internal, but connected with you as an organization, your shareholders, you know, your debt holders, your customers, your suppliers, your bankers, your competition. They are all people who are connected with you. Then you have a set of stakeholders who are external to you. They are not directly connected with you, but definitely they are there. You can't ignore them. You have to keep them satisfied like the government. The government doesn't come and you know interact with you on an everyday basis but yes the government would want you to pay your taxes on time the pressure groups the, the you know the local communities at large the professional as well as the regulatory bodies like the rbi for a banking institution right so these are all external stakeholders which you need to keep satisfied competitions aren't external well you you really can't you know ignore them every day your pricing, your policies, your decisions, which very well be impacted by your competitors on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is why we put competitors in our connected stakeholder group. Because very, very quickly you get impacted by what your competition is doing, what is working in the market, what is you know clicking in the industry. What is the meaning of pressure group? Pressure group means um, like your um, environmentalists, like your uh, community service groups, which want you to behave, which, which who can who create pressure on you as an organization to behave in an, in an ethical manner, in a manner which is acceptable to the society at large. Right, Priyanka? Wonderful. Any other doubt? Anything anybody would like to ask? That's precisely how I want you all to keep on asking me lots and lots of queries till the time you're actually, you know, clear with the concept. Only then will we go ahead with the next slide. Okay, quick, quick thing here. What do you think would be the expectation or the objective of the shareholders of the organization? What would they want? The shareholders. maximization of wealth absolutely what about the employees what would their objective be from the organization what would they want the employees would i be personally interested in my organization's wealth maximization for the shareholders if i am an employee Yes, my objective would be salary. My objective would be recognition. My objective would be status. My objective would be my own job security. The perks involved, isn't it? What about the objective of the customer of the organization? Tell me. 
what would you expect as a customer from the organization? Tell me, what would customers expect from organizations? Quality products at fair prices, absolutely right, Piyush. Better quality products at affordable price, good service. Yes, absolutely right, Rohit and Aryan. Better service, quality products, low price, quality products, after sale service. Yes, that's right. Wonderful. So these are all the expectations or the objectives of the customer, right? What about objectives of your creditors? Yeah, like your bankers who have given you like a bank loan. What would they be expecting from you? Timely repayment, timely interest payments. Yes. Like a collateral or a security maybe to keep them, you know, um, safe, to keep their investment safe. So what we see here is that, yes, there are many, many stakeholders who are associated with every organization and each stakeholder has their own objective, has their own agenda. And sometimes what we see is that these objectives are, you know, pulling the organization in different directions, really. Should I do this? Should I satisfy them? Should I, you know, look at maximization of profit or should I look at best quality product? Should I look at the safety and, you know, the work-life balance of my employees. So yes, all of these are pushing the organization in different directions as we may call it, right? So as a finance manager, you need to be able to make sure that you're able to manage all of these stakeholders in the organization and all of their conflicting objectives with each other as well, right? Oops because we clearly see that yes there seems to be some sort of you know strings being pulled in different directions and when that happens in comes in the agency problem now what is agency problem i'll give you a very very simple example to help you understand this who is the owner of the organization who are the owners of the organization tell me The shareholders, the equity shareholders, right. Wonderful, everyone. Who is it that, you know, who is managing the organization from, from like on a day-to-day -day basis? Are all the shareholders of Reliance Industries going to Reliance every day to, to run and, you know, operate the business? No, right? It is the directors and the managers who have been delegated the responsibility as agents of the organization to act on behalf of the real owners of the organization who are the shareholders to do what? To manage the organization. Now, quick question again. We've, so as for now, what we've understood is that the organization is owned by the shareholders but managed by the directors. Now, what is the expectation or objective of the shareholders of the organization? What does the shareholders expect from the organization? No, or we've just done that, right? Wealth maximization. Absolutely. What is the objective of the people who have been delegated the task of managing the organization? So what do you think would be the objective of the directors of the organization? What would, you know, their agenda be? Would they be so much interested in increasing somebody else's wealth? I am not the owner, right? I am just doing my job of directing and managing the organization. So my objective would be my own personal remuneration, my own personal bonuses, my own personal, right, you can say, you know, building my own wealth or building my own empire, my own personal job security per se. My recognition, my remuneration, right? Absolutely. So clearly, what do we see? That there is a problem. This problem is called the agency problem because the owners of the company and the people who are managing the organization do not have similar objectives. So one is pulling the organization in one direction and the other is pulling the organization in another direction, really. Right? 
So what we need to do to manage these conflicting objectives is to be able to incur some agency cost and try and close in this gap, this agency problem as much as we can. So now you tell me, how do I close on this agency problem? There is clearly this gap that we've identified here, right? There are, object, there are owners who have their own objectives, but there are people who are managing the organization, acting as agents of the owners, but they have their own personal objectives. So how do I bring goal congruence in these two different objectives? Tell me, anything that you can think of. Tell me, tell me. Uh, what, what possible recommendations do you have to be able to resolve this agency problem? We have to look out for their necessities also, yes? So what, what, how do I look out for the director's necessities? Internal audit is one way of checking on the fact that whether the agents are actually doing their work properly or not. Yes, RN. Giving them bonuses, that, that's precisely what I want, right? But still, why would I be bothered about increasing the shareholders' wealth? I am just only bothered about my own bonus. So even if that requires doing some sort of window dressing and alienating, you know, and, and uh, probably mishandling the accounts, to be able to earn my own bonus, I would probably do that. So what, what all practical recommendations can you think of to close this gap of objectives between the owners and the directors? Tell me, how do we bring across this goal congruence that is required? How about if I offer the directors their bonuses based upon the achievement of certain level of performance by the object by the organization so if the organization achieves an x amount of profits an x amount of shareholders maximization in turn the directors get a good bonus so what we are doing here is that we are linking the objectives of the organization the shareholders with the objectives of the directors and definitely committees regulatory requirements like corporate governance you know committees that we have they will be keeping a check on whether the directors are performing their duties towards the shareholders of the organization or not so these are two ways in which you can think of to resolve the agency problem right Is everybody okay with it? Read through how do we resolve agency problem? Read through the slide as well. Second point. No problem, absolutely, Hari. I will explain it to you again. So we clearly see now is that there is a difference between your, your owners who are the shareholders. They want their own wealth maximization, but they cannot be going to the office to run the operations of the business every day. So they hire agents in the form of directors to run and manage the business. However, the directors have their own set of targets only in terms of maximizing their own wealth and performance, right? So how do I keep a check on the directors? How do I keep, uh, you know, how do I incorporate a system of checks and balances on the directors to ensure that every decision that they will be taking would be towards the betterment of the owners of the organization only. So let's link their reward to the organization's performance by bringing across managerial reward schemes let's you know let's have the directors activities their decisions being scrutinized by regulatory requirements such as corporate governance committees internal auditors who would be scrutinizing that whether the decisions taken by the directors are in their own personal interest or is it in the best interest of the organization right 
yes absolutely that's a good point there ashish let's make that the directors the shareholders only let's give them the stock options of the organization so provide them with esops so this is where the esops is coming into i was just about to you know mention that so how what kind of managerial rewards do you do you pay bonuses related to the performance you could reward the managers in the form of giving them shares so you could you know literally make them shareholders only or you could look at an executive share option plan which is called an esop so what you are doing is that you are graduating you are basically aligning your directors to be to be to be the shareholders of the organization so that ultimately the objectives of the shareholders and the directors become the same that is wealth maximization of the shareholders right what benefits do you reckon this is going to bring across to the organization tell me benefits obviously now i'll be more aligned towards a good performance of the object of the organization itself i'll be you know more focused upon that the organization succeeds in its uh, you know in its collaborations and in, in its activities there is motivation there is alignment of objectives absolutely however do you think it's always just only like the rosy picture or does it have its own fair share of drawbacks as well read through the drawbacks very quickly on your screen what am i doing i'm only encouraging i'm only trying to tell the directors to become shareholders to focus upon increasing the profits of the organization so it definitely sometimes can result into a dysfunctional behavior right what else what else quickly read through the drawbacks red guys any doubts in this okay and the next is obviously when the directors are being forced by regulatory requirements to to you know they are enforced they are forced to follow 
certain protocols to make sure that the shareholders objectives are being fulfilled and rather than you know the directors just only looking at their own personal objectives so corporate governance listing requirements simply means that you know if you're listed on uh, the stock exchange you have to comply to sebi's requirements so that is simply again a check and balance system which ensures that the organization's decisions are always in the best interest of the organization okay what we will do now is before i actually dig deeper into this it's a good time to break for lunch i am just going to quickly break for lunch break for lunch um uh, till 2:30 let's break for lunch and then we shall all continue oh sorry it's i think only gone to one student so there is lunch till 2:30 pm and let's all get back post the lunch okay everyone i hope we have everyone back from the lunch break everyone's back shall we start so one of the ways of controlling the agency gap is by bringing in regulation regulation in the form of rules that you need to follow regulation in the form of governance that you need to comply to so one of the major factors that determine their organizations you know the way the organization gets directed and control is the way of the corporate governance so it's a system by which organizations are required to act control be get directed it basically the entire objective behind corporate governance is to reduce the amount of risk that is there in terms of you know over reliance on directors to make sure that the decisions are being taken not just only in the best interest of the organization but the best interest of the owners of the organization as well the overall performance is enhanced by good organization structures as well as management practices in terms of what is it that you are encouraging that organizations should operate by it's a framework for ethical as well as effective behavior in terms of this is what organizations should be doing this is what is considered unethical and thus should not be done by organizations you need to apply the spirit as well as the letter of the law which simply means that yes there are rules written in black and white that you need to comply to also behind these principles you have to follow the essence of the principle and not just you know try and get off it just follow the statement as a black and white statement you have to understand that if corporate governance is asking you to have separation between ceo and chairman of the company why is it they, you know that they are asking you to do it what is the essence behind the principle accountability is definitely one of the major theme that underpins corporate governance now corporate governance is one topic which you will be studying in much much detail in your sbl paper however from your fm's perspective just this much is going to be enough is going to suffice in terms of your knowledge very basically i'm just going to go through the basic principles of corporate governance and what does it basically mean and talk about so very quickly let's have a quick introduction of corporate governance and then we'll have a look at the best practices behind chapter 1 corporate governance let me just on full screen corporate governance concepts the basics of corporate governance let's take a look at some important questions regarding corporate governance we will start with what is corporate governance there are many definitions aimed at encapsulating the spirit of corporate governance corporate governance is simply described as the process by which organizations are directed and controlled in terms of authority accountability stewardship 
leadership, direction, and control. Corporate governance is more comprehensively described as the framework by which a company's board of directors and senior management establishes and pursues objectives while providing effective separation of ownership and control. It includes the establishment and maintenance of independent validation mechanisms within the organization that ensure the reliability of the system of controls used by the board of directors to monitor compliance with adopted strategies and risk tolerances. Why is corporate governance important? The implementation and maintenance of strong corporate governance policies ensure that proper oversight is in place to hold the organization accountable to the standards, laws, and regulations that it should be abiding by. Effective corporate governance helps an organization to achieve its objectives and desired outcomes and fulfill its obligations through sound strategic and business planning, risk management, financial management and reporting, human resource planning and control, and compliance and accountability systems. Effective governance also helps provide a framework for establishing responsibility to all of the participants connected to the organization spanning clients, employees, and providers of capital. An effective corporate governance framework is essential to a banking organization's overall safety and soundness. How is corporate governance assessed? Assessing corporate governance can be classified into four general topic areas, structure effectiveness, board supervision adequacy, management effectiveness, and adequacy of control functions. A three-tiered rating system of strong, adequate or weak is commonly used to summarize the results of an assessment. A review of structure effectiveness targets the organizational structure through a top-down review of legal entities, individuals, and policies. More specifically, it focuses on how clearly roles, responsibilities, and lines of authority, as well as communication channels, are reflected in the legal structure of the institution. In addition, it considers the quality of the ethics policy and the code of employee conduct established by the board to guide the actions of management and employees on behalf of the institution. A review of the adequacy of board supervision focuses on elements that demonstrate the ability of board members to understand and oversee the activities of the organization. Board charters are reviewed to understand the legal requirements that are established for the board by the shareholders. The assessment of board committees focuses on how committees are structured, the quality of minutes, and most importantly, the quality, frequency, and timeliness of information flow to the full board. Given the importance, additional attention is placed on the activities of the audit and governance committees. The evaluation of board supervision adequacy also considers board members and their qualifications, the reasonableness of compensation practices, the quality and accuracy of board minutes and reporting, and the adequacy and frequency of training and self-assessments. And finally, a thorough review will focus on board member attendance. Evaluation of management effectiveness centers on management committee charters and activities and line of business metrics. In particular, the review of this area focuses on the qualifications of committee members, the scope of committee activities, and the flow of information to the board. Line of business management through self-assessments and other reporting systems can provide useful information to the board of directors regarding risk profile and valuable insight for setting strategy. So, for institutions managed by line of business, which are typically the more complex institutions, the quality of self-assessments was evaluated. As control functions provide an independent assessment of the quality of internal controls and risk levels, their effectiveness and relationship with the board is an important component of corporate governance. In this context, evaluation of the adequacy of control functions focuses on the efficacy of the internal audit, external audit, credit review, and compliance. A three-tiered rating system of strong, adequate, or weak is commonly used to summarize the results of an assessment. A strong rating reflects that for all or a significant majority of the characteristics reviewed for each element, 
the institution performed at the highest standards possible, and no characteristics were rated weak. An adequate rating reflects an institution generally meeting expectations for each element, but could have anywhere from one to a few instances where individual characteristics did not meet expectations. These shortfalls could be easily addressed in the normal course of business and would not be significant enough to adversely affect any supervisory ratings. A weak rating reflects the institution had one or more characteristics where there were serious shortfalls in meeting minimum expectations. These shortfalls would require significant efforts to correct and could negatively affect an institution's supervisory rating. Now that we have answered some basic questions about corporate governance, let's take a look at the role that banks play in world economy. Okay, so that's about all that is required from your FM's perspective. Let's have a quick look at some of the best practices of corporate governance. What is it that corporate governance stresses very strongly upon, yes? Here, the focus is to make sure that the agency gap decreases. The directors are performing to their best of their abilities in order to maximize the shareholders' wealth. They are doing their job in the best way possible. So yes, a lot of governance or a lot of regulation has been brought across in the form of corporate governance to align those that, you know, that agency gap that we had identified. Quickly go through some of the best practices of corporate governance. So a lot of focus is given on having committees like audit committee, nomination committee, remuneration committee, risk management committee. A lot of focus is given on uh, splitting of power. So you know, there should be like uh, one CEO should be different from the chairman of the company. There should be like not unfettered power in the hands of one person in the form of the organization who is handling like both the key operations of CEO and chairman. There's a lot of, uh, you know, stress being given on the, on the appointment of non-executive directors who are independent directors in the organization to review the decisions being done by the executive directors of the organization. There's a lot of focus in having dialogue, dialogue with your shareholders. So, you know, uh, bringing the shareholders and the directors together making the directors answerable for their decisions to the owners of the company who are the shareholders. Quickly go through these best practices. Remember for your FM's perspective, you really don't need to go any further than what I'm already telling you here. When you do reach the SBL level, that is when we'll do this, start this topic in a full-fledged manner. Quickly read through this. Let me know when you've finished reading. Done. Others also, please confirm if you've done reading. Okay. Let's quickly have a look at one more quick information about corporate governance, how it works. Just quickly play it on. Okay, so what do we have here? What? 
Let me just switch on the subtitles. Full screen and there we go. To the responsibilities of a non-executive director. A non-executive director is a board member without responsibilities for daily management or operations of the company or organization. Non-executive directors are selected and appointed for their personal qualities, experience in similar organizations or industries and specialist knowledge. Non-executive directors are not employed by the company, but appointed through a letter of appointment. Non-executive directors typically sit on the main board and have responsibility on the board subcommittees example, audit committee, risk committee, nomination committee, remuneration committee, etc. They challenge, question and monitor the CEO and senior management. They bring an independent perspective to decision making. They hold senior management to account, they also support and mentor the CEO and senior management. They are a critical friend and must act in the interests of the company's stakeholders, such as shareholders, employees, pensioners and suppliers. Strategic expertise, the ability to review the strategy through constructive questioning and suggestion and contributing to the effective decision making of the board. Knowledge of a director's responsibilities includes an understanding of the role as well as the legal, ethical, fiduciary and financial responsibilities. Accounting and finance, the ability to read and comprehend the company's accounts, financial material presented to the board, financial reporting requirements and some understanding of corporate finance. Legal, the board's responsibility involves overseeing compliance with numerous laws as well as understanding the individual director's legal duties and responsibilities. Risk management, experience in managing areas of major risk management to the organization. Managing people and achieving change, experience in current management thinking on employment, branding, engagement, strategic vision and stakeholder communication. Experience in executive remuneration and compensation. Non-executive directors receive compensation, which tends to be a function of the size of the company, time commitment and complexity of the role. So this is exactly what the role of the non-executive directors is in the organization and why they are, you know, why they are brought across. How do they bring across corporate governance and best practices of corporate governance? Apart from this, what also you could do as a compliance measure is to comply to the stock exchange on which your company is listed so like some things you know like an organization is listed on the bombay stock exchange or delhi stock exchange it has to obviously comply to the sebi's requirement similarly if your organization is listed in the new york stock exchange you have to comply to not just only the uk corporate governance code but also the london stock exchanges listing requirements also so again, this is something that brings across a lot of, uh, you know, direction in the organization's activities and decisions and closes on the agency gap that we have identified. Okay, that actually brings us to an end of your first chapter. Any doubts? Any, any doubts in the entire chapter that we've done today? So we've basically done the entire introduction Yes, this was the first chapter, Aryan. Let me open up. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. So I can just quickly log on to my um, ebook. Let me just very quickly show you what the chapters are going to be like. Bear with me. So I'm just going to open up the workbook. Let me start sharing my screen again so that we very quickly go through the chapters. So these are all my ebooks.
So this is just I also need to update my ebook. In fact, I've got it updated. I don't know why still it is showing the previous version to me. But nonetheless, I'll just quickly run through the chapters here. So what we will do is as soon as we finish off like part A of the syllabus, we'll then open up our workbook. We'll do all questions from your workbook. So there are a lot of examples given in your workbook. So we'll do each and every um, topic here from the workbook. Let me just collapse this. Okay. So my part A of the syllabus includes two chapters which is my financial management function and the financial management environment. Okay, so there we are. This is the BPP's book. Just going to very quickly run through it. So these are the topics. Let me just split it part wise so that you know how we are going to be looking at this. So this is the financial management function. This is part A of the syllabus. So here we are on part A. This is chapter one that we've just done. This is my financial management function. We are now on the workbook. We will be doing questions from the workbook. And then we'll open up our practice and revision kit and do lots of questions from your practice and revision kit as well. Yes, this is where all the chapters are split subject wise. So you have 15 chapters to do in all. We have just done our part A today. Just gonna open up the chapter from your workbooks first. So all of this at the beginning of the book is a lot of key points given to you, which we've already discussed, but I would still want each one of you to spare out some time and read through the first few pages of your BPP book, because it is just talking about the key skills that you require to be able to pass your paper. And definitely lots and lots of question practice is the most important skill that is definitely required. No two ways about it. This is my first chapter, which we've just done today. Just going to do some of the examples from your book. So quickly revise, revise the concept. This is everything that we've done today. Let me know if you have any doubts about it. I don't want to go very strong on you guys today because this was literally like the first chapter, of the first session today. So what I'm thinking of doing is that we will open up the workbook as well as the practice and revision kit tomorrow and we'll finish that off in terms of the practice. How long it would? Please tell how to purchase book. I think I've said that like many times now. Reach out to the team at PG Learning. This is the number. Please purchase your books. How many hours would FM demand for passing it? Okay. So around 60 to 70 hours of classes will be there. And approximately similar 60 to 70 hours of home study would be required if you want to pass your FM exam. Simple. Right? So don't look at the number of hours, look at the quantity and the quality that of preparation that you are doing. Because everybody's pace is different. 
so if i may you know you may learn something in like one hour i may require two hours to do that so it all depends upon your pace and my pace but this is like on an average what i can say right aryan and for those of you inquiring about books i've already jotted down the number 9599983116 is where you have to call to purchase your books it is mandated for everyone to please buy your bpp workbook and practice and revision kit which comes as a combo for you to be able to do lots and lots of practice right yes 3 hours per day should be good enough but yes you have to be regular right so what i will do we will start off with question practice tomorrow we'll finish off questions from the workbook then we'll hop on to our practice and revision kit and finish off questions from our practice and revision kit as well till then please make sure that you are done with your homework which i have given you for today and i shall see you guys tomorrow same time thank you so much guys for joining in and one more very important thing here before i actually wind up today's session is that if there's absolutely anything you want me to change in my way of teaching in my way of uh, you know taking the class please 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 feel free to drop it down in the chat box i am open to all feedback good bad or ugly but yes i must know if there's absolutely anything else i can do to make you all more comfortable in your study towards your fm paper let me know please if there's anything speed of speak okay hari i really uh, you know try to speak very slowly but i'll try to speak even more uh, slowly if that makes a difference but uh, certainly there is a lot 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 that we have to cover and um, i'll try if i can reduce my speed of uh, speaking a little bit anything else aryan says no change you're too good all good wonderful please guys any other feedback you want to give across because i'm definitely open to all feedback and i would definitely you know try and bring across any any change that you would you know want me to make to uh, to for your better understanding really wonderful thank you so much guys for your uh, generous feedback and i shall then see you tomorrow and we shall start with question practice of part a of this syllabus thank you so much see you bye bye